All right, I'm just gonna get everything started. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Villascusa, and I am the sales manager for Concierge Escrow Service. Uh, we're here in Norwalk, California. Um, topic for today is gonna be ADU conversion and rent control. Uh, a lot of investors that we work with have asked many questions regarding the topic about ADU conversion. Uh, many of them have tried to do it and have gotten um, pushback from cities and you know they just need to know the ins and outs of how to go about the conversion itself and what cities can or cannot do or what restrictions they can and cannot impose. So something I don't really know a whole lot about, that's why I reached out to Rob. He's our general counsel attorney for the company. He handles pretty much everything for us. So the great resource uh, to reach out to if you ever needed anything real estate related down the road. Um, great person to be able to talk to. So um, I'll turn this over to Rob. He's got all the different slides. If you have any questions or can't see anything, I'll be managing the chat and controlling the uh, keynote side of it while he will be doing the presentation um, version of it as uh, speaking on, on, on that side of it. So go ahead and take it away, Rob. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, my name's Rob Von Esch and I've been practicing law now for about 18 years. Um, my uh, practice is focused on business construction and real estate law. A lot of my clients are uh, real estate professionals or developers or uh, contractors. So I've kind of got a pretty um, broad base of expertise in those fields. And I've always kind of found that if you're in real estate, you better know something about business because everyone who's in real estate for the most part is running a business of some sort. Uh, if you're in business, you better know something about real estate because everyone in business cares about real estate, invests in it. And if you're in business and real estate, you better know something about construction because it's kind of hard to do a lot of business in real estate without knowing how construction works too, because usually people that buy property uh, are going to do something with it, such as repairing it, developing it, whatever, which requires you to know construction. So that's really how I sort of developed my practice and my knowledge base over the years and why I've done it that way. Um, my firm is myself and uh, two other lawyers, and uh, we have a staff of about six other people that do support work. And um, I've been making this presentation for, I don't know, maybe two, three months now. There's a little bit of delay in uh, this presentation because of the coronavirus, so things kind of shut down for a bit. And now we're coming back by Zoom. So this is somewhat of a new format for me, just like it is for John in terms of making presentations. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, I'm going to do my best. Uh, my practice is located in Fullerton, and uh, today's topic is kind of some new things in the law for 2020. Uh, we're going to go through uh, some things that just directly pertain to real estate uh, agents and brokers. We're going to be talking about uh, ADUs, or otherwise known as accessory dwelling units. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, rent caps. Uh, we're also going to be talking about um, new eviction standards. And we're going to be talking about just what's going on in the world today uh, with coronavirus and how has that impacted uh, anything you might want to do in court, including evictions. So I'm hoping this is going to be some good information for all of you as real estate professionals. It's things you can use in your own business and things you can uh, pass along to um, your uh, clients and customers. So I'm going to start with something easy and that should go pretty quick. Um, in 2020, in the business world, a lot of people were talking about this thing called Assembly Bill 5. And essentially what that said was, uh, for the most part, it's pretty difficult to work as, in the, in, as an independent contractor in the state of California. Uh, the state of California has kind of taken away a lot of the ability for people to work as gig workers, like, you know, workers that do a lot of little things for different employers, uh, but they're still working as independent contractors. It's even really hurt companies like Lyft and Uber and a lot of the trucking industry. In fact, there's some major court cases up right now 
trying to challenge this assembly bill five because these types of workers want to be able to maintain their independent contractor status. And the reason the state, I think, has tightened what is uh, going to qualify as independent contractor uh, status is really quite simple. It comes down to revenue. Um, when employers run payroll, as you probably know, they have to pay payroll taxes. So that is money that's going straight to the state out of the payroll process. So it's just a direct cash infusion into um, the tax accounts of the government. So it's a nice revenue stream for them. When people work as independent contractors, it sort of deprives the government of that tax revenue stream. Instead, they have to wait at the end for you to file a tax return if you're working as an independent contractor and to honestly declare how much you're making in order to get their revenue. So um, the state might tell you there's other reasons that they're doing it, but uh, myself and others really wholeheartedly believe that one of the major reasons this is all happening is for revenue. Now, how does this impact you? Well, your California Association of Realtors um, did you a big favor because what the California Association of Realtors didn't want to happen was for there to be any confusion about whether agents and brokers still maintain their independent contractor status. So what happened is when Assembly Bill 5 was passed, the state legislature also um, enacted Labor Code 3351 and 2750.3. And these two code sections reinforce the law as you've known it for a long time now, which is that you guys maintain your independent contractor status. So if anybody was sort of, sort of wondering how the new Assembly Bill 5 that's caused shockwaves through the business world of California impacted you, now you know. It really doesn't. Of course, if you have staff that's working in a non-licensed professional capacity, such as just an assistant or something like that, or a receptionist, um, they're not gonna qualify as gig workers or independent contractors, and they're gonna have to be ran through payroll. And if you don't do that, you might find yourself in trouble by way of a lawsuit from said employee when he or she is terminated. They usually then complain about this for the first time after happily accepting the independent contractor status pay because it's usually a higher gross pay to them. But when you let them go and they get mad, then they complain, they file a suit, make labor code claims, and then it comes back to bite you in the butt. So just to reiterate that one more time, and then I'll move on, agents and brokers still maintain their independent contractor status, but your non-licensed support staff is gonna have to be ran through payroll. Okay. So now moving on to what I think is kind of the more interesting um, topic to go into and that probably a lot of you have had some questions about, uh, had discussions about it. And um, there's been a lot of, in my opinion, um, kind of confusion about what's going on with accessory dwelling units, otherwise known as ADUs. And in case anybody here doesn't know what an ADU is, and again, that stands for accessory dwelling unit, it's basically a guest house on a single family uh, residential lot. So you can put a guest house in the backyard or I suppose somewhere else on the property, and uh, it's a separate residential structure on the lot. So um, kind of some big changes in the ADU law, uh, in 2020. And essentially what happened is we had Assembly Bill 68, Assembly Bill 881, Senate Bill 68, Senate Bill 13, and Assembly Bill 587, all approved by the state legislature. And what this said is a single family residential owner can convert his or her garage or another space in the existing structure to what's called a junior ADU, or they can create a separate structure detached called an ADU. So just so there's no confusion here, this law is allowing for two things, a junior ADU and an ADU. And the difference is the junior ADU is 
something that is being built within the existing structure. So the most common way you'll probably see that is people will take their garage and then convert it into a junior ADU. So you can put you know, a little kitchen in there and a little bathroom facility, and that will be a separate structure that could be rented out, or you can have family live in there, do whatever you want to do with it. But basically, it will turn your single family home into two homes. Now, there's a difference between the junior ADU and ADU requirements that's really important. So I'm going to get that out right now. And that is to build a junior ADU, the owner of the property must be living or planning on living at the time they're pulling the permit in the property. So the owner can either live in the primary residence or can plan on living in the junior ADU part of it. So but the key thing is, is that person has to be treating the property as their primary residence. So you can build a junior ADU, live in that yourself. Let's just say you're elderly and you want some income. Well, you can create your junior ADU, move yourself into that, rent out the rest of your house and make some nice money. Or if you want to bring in family to help care for you, you can do that too. But again, it has to be a primary residence. On the other hand, the ADU or the accessory dwelling unit, which is again that detached structure, you don't have to be living in the property as your primary residence to build that. And there was a lot of confusion about that. In fact, there was publications that I read in the legal community that suggested that the ADU still required you to live in the property um, as a resident in order to develop the ADU. And I even had a recent conversation with John where I was talking about that with him. And um, it was pointed out to me not too long ago by an architect. And architect is a great source for information on what the cities or counties are permitting for construction because it's all they do. They have to go through the building standards and submit plans and get them approved. And I was talking to an architect recently and he said, yeah, the city of LA and Pico Rivera and all kinds of other cities are interpreting the statute that I was just telling you about, the ADU statute, to say that if you do not live in the house, it's okay, you can still build an ADU. Now, that kind of creates some potential income opportunities for people in the, in the real estate world because if you're able to buy a single family home and then build a separate ADU structure on it, you now are, you know, potentially adding quite a bit of cash flow to your bottom line if what you're doing is intending to acquire the properties for rental purposes. Um, now, there's, I'm going to throw this disclaimer out there, too, because I've heard this from other real estate professionals. I've gotten mixed reviews on this so far, but for the most part, the lenders and the appraisers that I know are telling me that they're not necessarily seeing these ADUs really make a big difference on how the banks are appraising the properties. I've had a few tell me otherwise, but for the most part, I've seen the majority of these professionals telling me they're just not seeing the banks having caught up to this ADU law yet, and they're not really giving the value to the property that um, you might otherwise see if you were to buy a duplex, for example, and do a cash flow analysis on that, that they're just not seeing banks do that. So I'll leave that up to you. I'm just throwing that out there. I've heard a mixed bag of reviews on how banks are treating this. but I suppose that in the short term, if what you're looking to do is to either acquire a property yourself or guide clients through the acquisition of properties for the purposes of cash flow, well, here you go. Use this information to your advantage. They can buy a property, develop an ABU on it, and have dual income streams even if they don't plan on living in this property. Now, before I go much further on this, um, the law, in case you want to look at this yourself, has been 
added to my presentation and John said that it's available to you guys as separate attachments. So I've got three attachments that are called ADU1, ADU2, and ADU3. And in there is the state law. And as an example, I gave you the development standards that are being utilized by the city of Los Angeles for the development of ADUs and junior ADUs. So I'll go into it a little bit, but as an aside, I would recommend that if you guys have any interest in this, it, from a serious standpoint of advising people on this or doing this yourself, that you go ahead and look at this. And these are the materials that I received from the architect recently. So these are up-to-date materials that architects are using to prepare plans and submit them for approval to the city of Los Angeles. All right, so back to the uh, ADU law. This is kind of a, a nice development in the world of real estate because what's going on here and what's kind of an exciting change is the state has been for a long time trying to figure out how to deal with their housing crunch, the housing shortage or the housing crisis. You hear all kinds of different labels to describe this issue. And what the state has decided to do is for the next few years through 2025, let's utilize this ADU law that I was just talking about to allow people to build these junior ADUs and ADUs as a way of solving our housing shortage. So essentially what they've allowed people to do is to take their single family residential lots and potentially turn them into a triplex. And the way this would work is if you're living in the property or intending to live in the property at the time you're pulling the permit, you can take the garage, for example, or some other space in the existing house and turn that into a separate junior ADU. And then you can build another structure detached in the backyard, for example. So now you've just taken a single family residence and turned it into a triplex. And if you're going to live in that property, what a tremendous income stream that might, that might be for you. And if you're willing to deal with the potential intrusiveness of having other people living on the property with you, you can make some great rental income on this. So that's, that's kind of exciting. And um, also, if you want to just acquire a single family property, rent it, and then move on and acquire another, Remember, you can build an ADU without living on the property. So you can go ahead and uh, it makes a nice income on this stuff. Uh, also, something else to keep in mind is that the government, through the passage of this new law, has um, sped up the time frames within which the cities or the counties must approve your plans, which is a nice change, too. Um, if any of you guys have ever built anything before uh, or tried to even do a remodel where you have to submit plans to the city, um, you might have noticed that sometimes it can take a long time to get your plans approved. In fact, what you might have experienced is that you'll submit plans, they'll come back to you with corrections, you'll resubmit, they come back with corrections again. And that, that process, depending on where you are and what you're trying to do, can take months and I've seen it go into taking a year or more, depending on where you are and what you're trying to do. I mean, you go do something in Malibu or, or Beverly Hills, and you'll find out what intense scrutiny is all about. It, it can get really difficult to get stuff built. So what the government has done is with this ADU law to solve their housing shortage has said these plans have to be reviewed within 60 days as a matter of law. So... That's great news. So you can get this stuff approved quickly. In fact, what I've seen happen in a few locations is um, the cities have just already got pre-approved plans drawn up that you could just go and submit the permit for and then pick up the pre-approved plans for an ADU. And I'm not sure if they already have pre-approved pre plans for junior ADUs but I've certainly seen cities have pre-approved plans for the ABU, which again, is that, that separate structure of guest house. So that's great. So you can just go down, pay the permit fee, pick up the plans, and you can start building. Or even if they don't have the pre-approved plans, they still have to approve it 
within 60 days. Now, if anybody in here has ever tried to do this or has talked to somebody who's tried to do this before these changes in the ADU law, you might have kind of ran into some obstacles in trying to build the ADU, for example, because the cities would impose setback requirements or minimum um, ADU size requirements. And that was done for a very deliberate reason. Basically, what the cities were intentionally doing was making it very difficult, if not impossible, for the average single family residential owner to build an ADU. They just didn't want high density in their neighborhoods. And you guys might even in your own experience and have even personal thoughts about this. There's a lot of people that have very strong feelings about whether this ADU and junior ADU legislation is a good idea. People don't want their spread out traditional single family residential existence in community to change to a densely populated urban area. So, um, you know, there was a lot of pushback. There's a lot of strong feelings about this ADU, but going back to my point is that cities impose these setback requirements and minimum size requirements to basically make it impossible for the average person to build an ADU. Well, the legislature has been very well aware of what the cities have been doing historically. So what they've done in this law is they've said, from this point forward, uh, any setback requirements that are in excess of four feet are invalid. And there are no minimum square footage um, size requirements for the ADU. So uh, that means then essentially the how the edge of the ADU can be within four feet of the existing single family structure or four feet of the neighbor's property line which is really not much. I mean, if you guys were to, even the smallest person in the audience to stretch out their arms, guarantee you that your arm span is more than four feet. So that's not much at all. So you can really build an ADU in a very tight space. And again, keep in mind, there's no minimum square footage size. So you guys ever watch these homes that are popular on TV now, there's this kind of whole new tiny house movements, you know, and there's these shows that um, celebrate the tiny house construction movement and showcase all these people building these really kind of cool and interesting homes in what could be as little as 100 square feet. Well, you can now build that as an, AD, as an ADU if you wanted to in your average backyard. I would say an average backyard is likely to accommodate a 10 by 10 structure somewhere within these parameters. So it's gotten very easy to build these now as a result of these requirements. And um, I, I just now noticed a, a typo and I wanna point this out and I thought I corrected this and I did correct it in one place, but there's a place where I missed it guys. So if you're looking at this slide with me on number two, the very last sentence says, must live on the property to build an ADU. It should say, must live on the property or plan to live on the property to build a junior ADU. It's a very important difference, and I apologize for making that mistake. So please go ahead and uh, make sure that you note that on your handout or make a note now um, so that if you do print this out or save it, you're aware of this, this problem. In fact, in the, if we go now to slide two, John, we can go ahead and move to slide two. Okay. Fine. There you go. Slide two. Rob, section. There was a couple of questions. You want to go over those now or at the end? If, if you don't mind, um, why don't we go through the ADU topic and then I'll okay. go back and answer ADU questions before I move on to the new one. Okay. Sounds good. I just wanted to bring it up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so section 2A, this is now the very top part of slide two. The what I meant to say is accurately stated there, and that is that an ADU can be built without living on the property as a primary residence. So I made the mistake and a typo by saying it incorrectly at the end of section two of slide one, but here in section A, it, the law is correctly stated. So please take note of that. Um, another thing to uh, take note of is what's uh, kind of stated in uh, section B of slide two, and that is the government code section 6582.26 
permits an, ADB, an ADU to be sold separately from the single family residence property if the property was developed or built by a qualified nonprofit corporation subject to a tenancy in common grant agreement, which is basically just a repurchase option by a nonprofit or a qualified buyer occup um, occupancy ADU is a primary residence. And there's other ways to structure this. The real main thing is what they don't want people doing for profit is building an ADU and selling it as a separate structure. So they don't want, you know, regular Joe Blow buying a single family residence and then all of a sudden turning himself into a traditional developer, building an ADU and then selling it off. But you can do this and even do it for profit if you do it as, as a nonprofit organization. Now, what I'm not is an expert in nonprofit, but I know enough about it to, to be dangerous. And I know enough to tell you that you know, nonprofits can be used to make quite a bit of profit. Um, and the kind of the way you, you go about doing it, and if you want to, if you want to explore this, you should go talk to somebody and I can give referrals to get some expert advice on this. But really, traditionally, a corporation, when it makes profits, distributes the profits as distributions or dividends, depending on whether you're a C corp or an S corp. And those are for profit corporate structures. Nonprofits, they don't distribute profits like that to shareholders. Instead, what the nonprofits can do to make their owners or the organizing persons a lot of money is they just pay those persons a huge salary. So, I mean, you could, I guess, in theory, set up as a nonprofit, get qualified and start selling ADU units if you're doing it and willing to do it in a nonprofit corporate structure. Um, but I'm just throwing that out there. When I read this law that I just told you about, which again is sub, is sub part B, I see that as, okay, well, here's a loophole. You can sell these ADUs, but you have to do it as a nonprofit and subject to the other requirements. You could probably still do it in a way where you're making money, but it has to be done as a nonprofit paying yourself a wage, which subjects you to more tax rather than doing it through distributions in some cases. But anyway, it's possible, and I'm throwing that out there. Another thing that you need to keep in mind is I think I sort of mentioned this earlier, which is if you have a single family home and you're going to live in it, you can turn it into a triplex. You can convert the garage, for example. You still have the main residence that's livable, and then you put an ADU in the back. But what now if you bought a duplex? Let's say the duplex was your traditional duplex. It had two units with a common wall. Let's say it was two three bed two bath units side by side with a common wall each had their own two car garage and a backyard for example and that's a pretty traditional uh, duplex you see those all over the place in all kinds of places in la you'll find those and uh, what you could do with those based on the way this law is structured is that you can convert the garage of each of the unit. if you're living in one of them you can convert the garage of each of the units into a separate junior ADU, and then in theory, build two separate ADU structures in the backyard, assuming you have enough space. And again, if you can squeeze 200 unit ADUs into the backyard and comply with the minimum four foot setback requirements, you've now just taken your duplex and turned it into a sixplex. So um, if you're not willing to live in it, you could still build the two ADUs in the backyard, again, so long as you can comply with the setback requirements and turn your duplex into a fourplex. So there's some interesting cash flow opportunities that have been created by this new law. And just as a practical standpoint, I would say that I'm here just educating you guys. I think the real practical first step in taking this and taking this information in this new law and building an ABU or a junior ADU is going to an architect because the, I mean that talking to the architect the other day just kind of opened my eyes up to in a way like, Oh yeah, common sense. Like why would this be different than any other thing you build? Of course you're going to go to an architect first when you're having approved plans drawn up or you're trying to do something that changed your property. You come to the lawyer if you run into a problem with, what your architect has been trying to do for you. So for example, if the architect was to report back to you and say, or even if you were to go try to pull your, your 
um, permit yourself. Say, for example, you're going to avail yourself to those pre-approved ADU plans and you're going to go pull your permit. But the city or the architect says to you, hey, we're not going to let you do that unless you build a unit that's at least 300 square feet. Or we're going to impose a setback requirement on you of, you know, six feet or 10 feet. Those are violations of this law. That's when you would come to the lawyer and say, hey, I've got a problem here. The law says this, but the city or the county is making me do it differently. That's when you come to the lawyer. But from a practical standpoint, I would encourage you guys to start your ADU or junior ADU construction by going to see what kind of pre-approved plans are already on file with the city or the county and or going to an architect. And if you guys wanted a referral to an architect, I could definitely give you one because I talked to one who was pretty knowledgeable about this just a few days ago. So I can certainly make that referral for you. All right, I'm now moving on to, uh, still on slide two, but section three, which is titled construction and rental of AD units, ADU units in an HOA. And HOA is just an abbreviation for Homeowners Association. And for certain parts of Southern California, there are homeowners associations all over the place. I mean, Orange County is loaded with them, uh, especially in cities like, you know, Yorba Linda, uh, Anaheim Hills. There is loaded with homeowners associations. So there is law about homeowners associations and how they can control the ADU and junior ADU construction process. And if you're going to acquire a home in a association or you own one in an association, then you need to be aware of this. And that is that California Civil Code section 4751 states that any provision that prohibits or unreasonably restricts the construction, use, or rental of an accessory dwelling unit or junior accessory unit on a lot zoned for single family residential use is void and unenforceable. So before I digest all that for you and walk you through all of the dynamics of that, let me just say this one thing, and I put it in bold on uh, the slide I prepared, and it's in bold for you at the bottom of three. And that is a condominium is not subject to this law. This is only a single family home in a HOA. So a single family home in an HOA, you can't be unreasonably restricted from developing an ADU or a junior ADU. But a condo is a whole different ballgame. They can restrict that according to this law. They can restrict it severely according to this law. And the reason I bring that up is because sometimes, as some of you have seen, in uh, back the very first home I ever bought, it was like this. The home looked like a single family home. It was detached, but the developer, in order to build a single family home on a smaller lot, had it zoned and approved as a condominium. So technically it was a single family home, but legally known as a condominium so that he can squeeze the property and build more houses on a smaller lot. And those are around, and I'm sure you guys have seen those before. So be careful because if you're giving somebody advice, make sure they understand that just because it looks like a single family home, it might not be, it might be a condo. And if you're going to try to do one of these junior ADUs or um, ADUs in an association, make sure you've got a single family residence and not a condo. Because if it's a condo, even though it might look like a single family home, you're probably not going to be able to do it. So just watch out for that little technicality. Now, going back to being able to build these ADUs in associations where you have true single family residential lots and homes. The law is brand new. And the law specifically says that condo associations can't unreasonably restrict the development. So what does that mean? That means that is completely unknown completely untested in courts of law. I mean, this law just went into effect at the beginning of this year, essentially. And for, I don't know, what, two, two months, maybe a little bit more now of this year, we've essentially had our courts shut down for any forms of civil litigation as a result of coronavirus. So I'm unaware 
of any single lawsuit that has been filed as a result of an association saying, we're not going to let you build this thing. We don't want that in our community. We have CCNRs that prohibit that kind of thing, and we're not going to allow it. And they can come up with a million different reasons. Parking is going to be a problem. You're going to block somebody's view because a lot of these associations do create view rights, especially, for example, if you go to places like Newport Beach, a lot of those homeowners associations have view rights built into their CCNRs. People are spending big money for that view. They want to protect it. So um, I don't know what is going to happen in terms of decisional case law about what is a reasonable versus an unreasonable restriction. So in, the reason I'm bringing this up to you is if you acquire a single, a true single family residential property that's in an association, be mindful of the CCNRs and be mindful of the fact that you might run into a lot of pushback from the neighbors or from the board of directors for the association if you try to build one of these things in an association because there just is no decisional case law telling us what an unreasonable restriction is at this time. And just to kind of give you guys an example of how uh, nitpicky some of these associations can be, um, oh, I'd say like three years ago, I had a uh, contractor come to me and say, hey, I'm trying to build a property in Newport Beach, and they're not going to let me add on a uh, second story to the house. And it wasn't even a full true second story. It was what I described and what he described as just a pop-up. There was one section above the garage where we wanted to pop it up to kind of give the uh, property this like little like nook study room area that you could access. It was actually really small, but that association required us to do what's called storyboarding. So you had to put up all of these poles around the property showing the exact dimensions of how this would look when it's built. And then you had to connect the poles of streamers. And then all of the neighbors in there had an opportunity to observe the streamers from their property, from any other vantage point that they desired within the association, and then object to the construction. If they thought it interfered with their view in some way, they had a right to object. And that would significantly interfere with, in fact, probably in this case, it prohibited their ability to build this little pop-out nook. So I'm just telling you, that's the kind of stuff you deal with, especially in the high-end communities. So uh, be mindful of that. If you're going to advise somebody to acquire a house in an association, uh, be mindful of the pushback you might be if you're also telling them, go ahead and build a junior ADU or an ADU. Um, so uh, I'm going to kind of move on from that. And that is a wrap up of what I wanted to talk about as far as ADUs go. John, you mentioned there's questions about ADUs. Um, there was a lot of information there, so I'll go ahead and turn the questions over to whoever is going to be the moderator for that because I can't see them. Okay, so I'll read them off here. So from Andrew, it says, I wonder why lenders appraisers wouldn't increase the value if an ADU would add extra bed and or bath. So I can kind of chime in on something like that. When you're building property, <clears throat> you need to be mindful of the area that you're building that in. So there's this thing with appraisers that it can be an overbuilt property for a specific area. So if there are no further comparables that can match the square footage and all those items that you're looking to build, if everything in there is a three, two, 1200 square feet and you turn it into a four, three with 50, no, 1800 square feet, but there's nothing else in the area that has sold for that same consistency, then you're going to be overbuilt for the area. So that's probably why there's a big, disconnect with lenders right now is because lenders are basing it on value valuation property for the area not just brand new construction that just went out so i would say that'd be number one if rob you want to chime in on that one if you have any other commentary for it you know i all i know is honestly john is just what i've heard from people such as yourself that are professionals in your industry i mean that are appraisers and lenders i mean honestly every time i've done this I've always enjoyed asking the audience, especially the ones that are knowledgeable about appraisal and mortgage, 
uh, or, or otherwise have experience with this, please, if you don't mind, if, if they're able to, John, share with the audience what your experience has been on having these things appraised. If, if anybody here has any experience on what that's been like, I, I would love to hear from you. So I can give you a case example from uh, the real estate office that I also work out of. Uh, an investor had purchased a property. It was in the city of Whittier. He bought it, what seemed like a high price at the time for a two bedroom, one bath with a detached, it was a very good size uh, two car garage. Purchased it for 400,000 and resold it, you know, roughly six months later for a little over 750, I believe. So there was tremendous upside with this new construction and it was just a two one with a two one and no garage. So it was just, on street parking or driveway parking only. Um, it was set up as two separate structures, so it did look like two homes on a lot, uh, but that was a, the potential upside. And I, with those, because Whittier is such a diverse neighborhood, there's plenty of different comparables that you can pull from to get that comparable, that analysis that you're looking for. So that's what I think you would have to be mindful of when you're talking to clients, you're looking at neighborhoods about what this could potentially do for them is they need to, whatever they're planning to build. You need to see if there's a comparable for that type of property. If they were ever trying to refi or sell this down the road to make use of the money they're investing in the property. Uh, next question is from Emerson. Um, I also had this exact same question is, will this change anything with the zoning? So if this is a SFR, obviously zoned at SFR to start with and you build a junior ADU and an ADU, would that turn it into uh, triplex zoning or does it still stay as an SFR? It's, it's, it stays SFR. In fact, um, this is a perfect example to um, encourage the audience to go and look at the ADU 1, 2, and 3 attachments that I provided because the um, City of LA standards specifically address this and what it becomes is an SFR with an ADU. So that's just what they're going to call it. it doesn't become R2 or some, or R3 or something like that. It's still SFR with a with an ADU. That's how they characterize it. Okay, perfect. So next question is from Vanessa. Uh, what about tax implications and income tax have turned into a rental or an Airbnb? Well, that's a good question. So Airbnb, I mean, yeah, you could use, I mean, the whole point of the ADU is to rent it. The law didn't say how you can rent it. It's just they wanted it to be rented. Your, so your problem with the ADU is not going to be um, what this law is. It's going to be what your city law is on ADU. I mean, I'm sorry, on Airbnbs. And there's a lot of cities out there that have restrictions on how Airbnbs are done. They don't want daily rentals, for example. The minimum they want is 30-day terms. So uh, be mindful of that. There's a, there's a lot of cities that have tried to clamp down on that. And the reason is because cities are seeing themselves as being deprived of the tax revenues that they enjoy from hotel occupancies. So when you're renting out your property for a day rate as an Airbnb, you're competing with the hotels in the same community and you're taking customers away from the hotels, which deprives the city of uh, room tax. So that's, again, I go back to why there's city pushback on Airbnbs. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is, is you'll have these neighborhoods that just get torn upside down by people coming in for a day that behave differently than they would if they lived there. Um, there's this uh, complex in particular that I'm thinking of in Anaheim right by Anaheim Stadium. In fact, it's built in the Anaheim Stadium parking lot right across from a brewery called uh, Golden Road. And it's sort of a cool complex. I mean, there's a bar in there and a nice pool and everything. And uh, what people were doing is they were Airbnb-ing and being those, Airbnb those units. And people were coming in for a day to go to a game. They would party all night and then you know, go to the bars, come back, party more. And I mean, the people that actually were trying to live there were just livid with this. You know, they were saying it was noisy, it was dirty, they were trashing the pool. The association, the property manager were saying, were saying it was costing them more money to maintain the property because these Airbnb people, Airbnb owners were bringing these people in, they were trashing everything. So you still have to contend with that. So again, this law doesn't change 
what the Airbnb restrictions may be. You need to check with the city where your property is and, and go from there. That's really still what controls. Was there another part of that question or did I answer it? That answered it. Uh, well, the other part of it was reporting income tax. And I, I would assume if it's counted as income property, you're probably still paying income tax or should be reporting it in some manner. But that's yeah, any, anytime you get income, whether it's rent or any other form, you still have tax reporting requirements. Correct. Okay, so next question. We're going to move on to, uh, this is for Martin. So does this new law apply in Orange County as well? Yeah, it's a statewide law. Okay, easy answer. Um, we already answered the zoning question from Emerson. So Emerson, hopefully I answered your question regarding zoning, that it does stay the same. We have another question from Misty. Uh, can you build both a junior ADU in your garage and a regular ADU unit in your back lot in Orange County areas too? I think that answers it. Yes, it, again, it's a, state, it's a statewide law. So as long as you're planning on living in that property as your primary residence, you can go ahead and, and turn your SFR into essentially a triplex. If you're not planning on living in it, you can only build the ADU and turn it into essentially a duplex. Okay. A uh, question from Debbie is, what about a manufactured home as an ADU? Are some cities allowing them as ADU? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And um, the answer to that question is yes. In, in particular, LA is building and approving these really interesting, completely manufactured type projects. Um, in particular, what I'm thinking of is um, these shipping containers. People are taking these and turning them into homes now, and uh, they're pretty sturdy. I mean, think about what you're buying. You're buying a steel structure, reinforced, meant to hold cargo, withstand, you know, rolling and rocking and being stacked on ships and semis and trains, and they're turning those into homes. And you can go online and find these people who convert these things and sell them ready to go. You can just pay a fixed price and have it shipped to you. You'd be amazed at what some of these things look like. They actually look like super luxurious, modern type construction um, uh, ADU units or separate attached or separate units. In fact, just to go off on a little you know ramp here or go on a little side road, is they're even making swimming pools out of those things. I, I couldn't believe some of the swimming pools I saw being made out of that. So yeah, if you guys haven't gone and looked at what type of prefab manufactured housing is out there now, go take a look because it's getting pretty amazing what they're doing. You're going to soon be getting to a point where it's going to be hard to tell the difference in a lot of cases. Awesome. Uh, from, this is from Army. Is parking still an issue in regards to spaces for the ADUs? Well, certainly in an HOA, it's going to be an issue because that's how they're going to, that's one of the ways they're going to try to clamp down, especially when you're in an association that has smaller streets and stuff like that. So it's certainly going to be used uh, there. And as far as um, in the uh, normal context, you know, a single family home, no HOA stuff to uh, contend with. You know, the answer to that question is, is I, I'm not 100% sure. However, I do believe the answer to that question is in the ADU materials that I provided to you. So I apologize, I didn't take the time to determine the answer to that particular issue, but I'm pretty certain, just based on what I recall seeing when I was flipping through the ADU materials that I just recently got, that the answer to that question is in there. And if somebody, after having gone through the ADU materials, still doesn't know, feel free to privately contact me and I'll take a quick look. But the answer is, is in the stuff I gave you guys. I just don't know off the top of my head, I apologize. I think I can maybe chime in on that. Maybe I'm incorrect, but I, I believe I was, there was in some reading material I found that as long as it was, there was considered on-street parking available, that it wouldn't cause an issue with the ADU. Is that correct in saying that? Yeah, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to go out on a limb on that without having looked at that. I mean, I, I, my gut sense is the, the parking requirements aren't too tight. But uh, there, I just to me, it's common sense. There's got to be some kind of a parking issue. You can't just create a situation where the street's going to be impassable to fire trucks and stuff because there's going to be too many cars. But I don't, I don't think that it's going to be as restrictive as you might fear that it would be. And again, the answer is in these materials. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's in EDU too. 
I just would have to take the time to go and, and look at it. But I, if you if you look at ADU two, um, in fact, let me double check that. ADU, I'm sorry, ADU one guys. ADU one has this great question and answer section where the city of LA had their planning department and their legal team go through it and um, answer all the questions that you could possibly have about that. And I'm almost positive that one of the questions is exactly this. So just take a look at EDU1. The answer to that question is there. Okay, perfect. So uh, this is a question from Martin. If you're able to sell the ADU as a separate unit, does the ADU require its own address? So I guess this would be in reference if you are a nonprofit. Yeah, if, if you're going to separately sell it, it's going to have its own address, and there's a whole process that you'll go through to get that approved. If um, if it's if it's not being sold, that's a good question, and I, I just don't know the answer to that. But from a practical standpoint, when you get it approved, I mean it, that's going to all be taken into consideration. And just keep in mind the overwhelming point of what I've been trying to impose upon everybody and impress upon everybody today is this is now very streamlined and. A very guaranteed process so I don't know exactly the answer to whether it's going to be for example 2020 Chapman as opposed to 2020 a and B Chapman now if you add the the separate unit but it does it I mean I don't know is there some is there something I'm missing is it really gonna matter as long as it's approved if you're selling it obviously it's gonna have its own address but for you're just gonna have it and then rent out the unit or sell it with you know two occupied units or two occupi occupiable units. I don't really see what the difference is that, that would make. Is there some, is there something I'm missing? Is there some reason that would matter from your guys' standpoint? Well, selling it as two separate units means you could sell two single family homes now, basically. So there'd be, I guess, some degree of dividing the parcel to create two separate properties. And I agree with that. And keep in mind, I think the answer to that was was covered in what I was saying. The only way you could sell two of them, I mean, have, build an ADU and then sell the ADU separately or retain the ADU and sell the primary unit or primary residence separately would be as if you complied with that nonprofit approved status. So that's kind of a different deal. And, and just to reiterate, another nonprofit would have to purchase it, correct? No, another nonprofit would not have to purchase it, but you have to have an agreement in place that would say um, if the person that's buying it isn't a qualified low income resident, for example, the uh, developer would have the right to buy it back. I don't know if you guys have ever had any experience in uh, seeing these low income housing developments where they'll do that kind of stuff. They, they make you, for example, if you're a qualified low income person buying a house in one of these low income communities in Irvine, for example, if, if it wasn't for this low income status, these would be designation status. These would otherwise be million dollar homes, but they'll sell them to people for, it's funny, low income, you know, 650 or $750,000, which that's debatable about whether that's low income, but it, it is what it is. And, um, they will make those people promise not to resell it and then or for a certain amount of time. And then if they do resell it, it's still subject to pricing based on certain low income standards. So that's the kind of stuff that the, the nonprofit ADU um, regulations had in mind. If you're going to be separately selling off an ADU unit, I believe what they're trying to tell you is you're going to have to kind of comply with the spirit of these low income housing requirements that the cities will impose on you. Okay. But that doesn't mean that you still can't make a lot of money as a seller of these things. Because oh. again, keep in mind, William Lyon and these other builders back in the day that were doing these when housing prices were booming back in, you know, the pre 2009 timeframe, they were still making a lot of money building these things. All right, there's another question from Vanessa. I imagine there will be a reassessment on property and therefore property taxes will increase. How is that calculated seeing that it is an ADU? Well, yeah, certainly when you pull a permit, there's going to there's going to be a reassessment. I mean, that's kind of the downside of pulling a permit is, you know, you're now going to get reassessed in a lot of cases and and how it impacts property value. I mean, that's that's the that's a debatable 
um, discussion, right? That's sort of what we were talking about before. How does that impact value? Because in a way, when you pull a permit, that's sort of how you have the new tax base calculated is, well, what's the new value of the property once you pull the permit? I'm, I, I'll just kind of share my personal experience. And I mean, I've built a few different houses and done some significant improvements to houses that I have and um, have had in the past and have now. And uh, my experience, typically the permit you pull results in a tax valuation that is below what it, it is really worth in the resale world. Okay, cool. So I think that should answer her question. I don't think we have any more questions. So uh, if anyone else has any further questions, I would put them in now. I think Rob, we're, we're pretty much finished, right? With uh, ADUs and I can move on to other topics or everybody oh, yeah, has to go to work, that's fine. Yeah, so are you guys ready to move on from ADU? Just wanna confirm before we continue on this. Yes, okay, move on. All right, so I'm on to the next one, which is the uh, rent control. Okay, this is gonna go uh, much faster, but essentially uh, California Civil Code sections 1946.2, 1947.12, and 1947.13, as stated in slide three, I'm not sure if we're on slide three or not. Yeah, we are. Okay, great. You're, you're there. Sorry, John. Just couldn't see it. Um, basically say uh, the uh, statewide rent caps are now going to be 5% plus inflation or up to a hard cap of 10%, whichever is less. And also landlords may only evict for just cause unless a no fault reason applies. So there was a lot of uproar about this rent cap. And I actually went to a presentation by a um, by the National Apartment Owners Association and the um, lobbyist that was there as part of the National uh, Apartment Owners Association said the reason that they ended up stipulating to this legislation is they thought there was no way they could stop some form of this legislation from being passed and they thought that this was a good deal because in their point of view, the average landlord would not be raising the rent more than 5% plus inflation or 10% annually anyway. So, I mean, that's not in every situation, but they thought as a general rule, the average landlord was gonna have no problem abiding by these um, rent caps because it's more than what they would normally do anyway. So they thought they weren't really giving anything up in a way for them, they felt, they felt like they were just making a symbolic commitment that meant nothing in real life. So that was uh, why they ended up agreeing to this legislation. And uh, now going into the just cause or no fault stuff I was talking about. So again, just to reiterate, landlords may only evict for just cause unless a no fault reason applies. Well, just cause is kind of just obvious stuff. I mean, it's really the reasons that you could already evict, in my opinion, anyway. You don't pay rent, you can get evicted. If you're a nuisance and bothering the neighbors or the neighborhood, you can be evicted. If you're breaking the law, you know, selling drugs out of the property, you can be evicted. Uh, if you're committing waste, which is you're damaging the property, you can be evicted. If you, if you refuse to allow the landlord entry upon giving appropriate notice, you can be evicted. If you basically are breaching the lease and you fail to you know, stop whatever you're doing to breach the lease after you've received a notice from the landlord, you can be evicted. If you refuse to sign a new lease after your lease has expired, you can be evicted. Illegal assignments or subletting, you can be evicted. Um, so there's all just kind of the normal reasons and they're, they're in the slide, I'm almost reading verbatim. Those are all reasons you can be evicted. Those are just cause reasons, legal reasons to evict you. Now, there's um, the no fault, and those are, you don't have to have cause. You can just kick somebody out because you need to. There's, there's a no fault reason. And a big one is, well, you're withdrawing the property from the rental market. So let's say you're going to sell your house. You don't have to have a just cause reason to evict that person. You give notice, and the notice depends on how long they've been living there. They I mean, anybody can contest anything in court. I mean, you see stupid lawsuits all the time, but it's a lawsuit that that tenant will ultimately lose and they will be kicked out of the property if 
the owner of the property is kicking them, kicking them out because they're deciding to sell it and don't want a tenant in place, or because they're going to do a significant remodel. Perhaps maybe uh, you're going to add a junior aid to you, and now you want the person out of there as part of that process. Well, that would be a no-fault reason to evict them. Um, or you want to move your family in. You know, you want to have your children move in with you or a grandma, whatever. There's a bunch of different reasons that would be no fault reasons to kick somebody out. So um, that's kind of my summary of the rent cap and just cause and no fault changes in the law, if you want to call them changes. Does anybody have questions about that before I move on to uh, the next slide? There is one question right now from Army. Can they give you a notice telling you that they are going to make the home into two homes when in fact they did not? They are rented, they, they re-rented for a higher price. Okay, so we're talking about a, a notice to vacate because they're going to do improvements and remodeling, turning it into two homes. Is that the question? Correct, and they didn't, they just re-rented the property. That would be fraud and that would be actionable. That would be a that would be a that would be a violation of this law. So they tried to make it seem like it was a no fault eviction when when in fact it wasn't. That that a landlord could be sued over. Okay. Another question: Does this only apply to SFR? Or is this for any type of even multifamily? Any any property, even multifamily. Okay. That's it's just residential. That's the bottom line. This is not the commercial standards, but this right. is the residential, whether it's multifamily or single. Okay. We don't have any other questions. We can move. go to the next slide. Yep, sure. If you don't mind, let's just go to a slide. Let's see. Is it slide five, John? The one that has section five evictions in the California COVID-19 climate? Yes. Okay, we're going there. Um, Everybody's aware of this executive order by now that was signed by Governor Newsom and it essentially uh, prohibits the eviction of tenants that cannot pay rent due to COVID-19 through May 31st, 2020. We'll see if he's going to extend that. I mean, it, the, gov the governor seems like he's starting to loosen up about his COVID-19 restrictions, but uh, I could see him getting a lot of pressure to not put tenants into a situation where they're going to be faced with, okay, it's May 31st. Now we want your rent and landlords start evicting them. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if he ex extends that. I have no inside knowledge people. It's just me giving you my prediction. I wouldn't be surprised at all. If you see that extended out a little bit to give people more time. Um, you might've also noticed on the news that there's been these demonstrations by, uh, tenant advocacy groups that are asking for rent forgiveness. And that's a very different proposition than what exists right now because Governor Newsom is not forgiven rent. And that's a really important thing for everybody to keep in mind. Once the moratorium on the evictions runs out, which presently is May 31st of this year, the tenants have to work something out with the landlord and figure out how to repay the rent they didn't pay. And if they don't right now, the way the law is set up is the landlord can evict. Um, is there going to be rent forgiveness that's going to be forced upon landlords? I don't think so. And the reason is this, is even if Governor Newsom was to sign some executive order saying that he's going to you know, provide for some rent forgiveness, he can't do that legally in my mind, in my opinion, because the Constitution, and I'm referring to the United States Constitution now, has the Fifth Amendment. And the Fifth Amendment says that the government cannot deprive you of your property without a valid reason and without just compensation. So I suppose that if the governor was to say, I think there's a valid reason to deprive you of your rent, because I don't want to have a bunch of homeless people go out on the street. So as a public policy, we think it's a good thing to have rent forgiveness. If that's what the governor does, the constitution would then also require the state of California to reimburse landlords for the rent that they would have been able to recover. Because you can't deprive somebody unless there's a valid governmental reason and reimbursement. So they would have to reimburse you. So that would be a massive expense to the state. And I, I just don't know if the state's in a position to be able to bankroll some, something like that. I mean, they're already 
having a lot of shortcomings in their budgets, especially in their pension systems. So I don't know if they're going to be able to create that kind of money to pay landlords because ultimately if he did impose that law and did it in a way where he thought he was going to be able to do it without having to reimburse landlords, I think he would find himself overturned in court. So I, to me, it's just a clear violation of the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. So I don't, I don't anticipate rent forgiveness. Um, another thing to keep in mind, too, is that the present moratorium on eviction, the present governor moratorium, does not pertain to non-COVID-19 related reasons to evict somebody. So if the tenant's breaking the law is a nuisance, illegally subletting, uh, whatever, all the other reasons I told you that would constitute just cause eviction, if that's what this tenant's doing, you still can evict them right now. There's no moratorium on that. Or if you decide you want to sell your house or do significant remodel, those are all reasons that are legitimate reasons to evict somebody now. You're not prohibited from doing that by the government's, by the governor's executive order. So even if he extends it, you can still kick people out for those non-COVID-19 related reasons. And also keep in mind too, is that the, gov the governor's order, and a lot of people don't talk about this, also had a requirement in there that if the tenant was going to refrain from paying rent or not pay rent because he or she couldn't afford to do so because of a COVID-19 reason, say for example, their employer laid them off because of COVID-19, or they were sick and couldn't work because of COVID-19 had a family member that they had to care for because of COVID-19 and therefore couldn't go to work because they had to stay home and care for the family member. Those would be all COVID-19 reasons not to pay rent. But what the governor's order also said is that if the tenant's going to invoke one of those COVID-19 reasons, within seven days of the rent being due, he had to, or she had, he or she had to give the landlord written notice of their COVID-19 reason for not being able to pay the rent. So they didn't have the moratorium protections unless they gave that notice, and a lot of tenants did not. In fact, one of the things I was telling clients who were calling me is, why don't you stay quiet for seven days or more, a little bit longer, then see what happens, and then they're not going to be able to use the COVID-19 um, as a reason for not being evicted if the reason that if they failed to give that notice, so kind of lull the tenant into silence or into, into complacency and don't alert them to what the seven day notice requirement is. Let them fail to do it. And then now you've got leverage over them. Um, sorry guys, most of the people I represent were, would be you know the property owners. So I gave that, that was kind of what I was thinking. That was sort of my strategy on how to deal with this. But that's a legal strategy. You know, I mean, the practical problem we're facing right now is the courts are just closed. I mean, so even if you could kick someone out right now, it would be hard to do. I mean, there are, you can go in and get restraining orders. So if somebody was trashing your house or committing crimes in there, like dealing drugs, whatever, you could go get a restraining order and, and perhaps have their legal activity stopped or have them, you know, removed from the property if they were a real threat to safety or the, the property. But you'd have to be able to demonstrate that to a very high degree of certainty to get that restraining order issued. Absent that, I mean, the courts are just gonna remain shut down for the most part until the end of the month, if not a little bit longer. I mean, it's kind of debatable when these courts open uh, because the chief justice in the state of California who is the one who regulates all of the superior courts and the court system that facilitates civil lawsuits for most of us, including evictions, is the civil court superior court system. That chief justice really said, I'm going to, in a lot of ways, leave it up to the presiding judge of each county. So Orange County has their own presiding judge. LA does. San Bernardino does. Riverside, every county has their own presiding judge that has their own standards of uh, when they're going to restart. So, for example, I'm here in Orange County, so I recently watched the presentation from uh, Judge Nakamura, who is our Orange County presiding judge. So he's the one who's in charge of all the courts in Orange County, and there's, a, there's at least four or five uh, that would do these types of uh, hearings. Anyway, uh, he specifically said, I'm not starting evictions until June 15, 2020. 
And if you have any kind of a civil dispute with somebody, let's say there's a breach of contract situation, let's say that you're in the middle of a real estate transaction and somebody's going to accuse the seller of failing to disclose something, you're, you're looking at at least probably a year and a half. If you were to file when the court opens up and the court will probably open up for filings for things like that in uh, sometime at the end of the month or beginning part of of June, that would just allow you to file the documentation. You're probably looking at a backlog of two years before you actually get that thing to trial in reality. And, and, and there's a reason for that is because while the courts in all of the counties in the state were shut down because of COVID-19, there was a backlog and the criminal system has priority over the civil system because there's constitutional requirements that ensure a criminal uh, defendant gets a speedy trial, speedy and fair trial. Otherwise, it's a violation of his due process rights. So what we're being told is our civil judges are going to be reallocated to the criminal system to move all of their cases and get those trials wrapped up or get plea deals in place so that they don't have a constitutional crisis on their hands. So that means the civil world, where we don't necessarily have these constitutional requirements for a speedy trial, we're taking a back seat. So there, there's going to be a backlog in the resolution of our disputes that we would have in our normal business dealings. And depending on what side of the dispute you're on, that could be a good thing. For example, if somebody's going to be insisting that you're the one that pay money, you're the defendant, you might be happy that there's a delay in it. But if your property's tied up because there's a loose pendants or something, uh, recorded against it, you might not be happy because you're going to perhaps get strung along for a very long time waiting for resolution. So one of the things I've been reminding people of is when you can advan take advantage of the ADR clauses that are in a lot of our standard real estate agreements, do so. Now is the time to really be taking a close look at your CAR residential pur purchase agreement and see if you had customers that check the box to force arbitration of disputes. Because if you can get something into arbitration right now and save yourself a ton of time, you might want to do that. Now is really the time to understand how important the arbitration clause might be for you. And I, I put some more of the uh, um, LA Superior Court timeframes on here as well. But unless there's any questions about that, I'm going to move on to slide seven and we'll be done pretty shortly here. Uh, I don't think there are any other questions right now. No. Okay. Uh, just want to make sure everybody knows that HUD, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac, so if you've got loans that are backed by them, suspended foreclosures during the uh, crisis. So that will, uh, as of right now, based on current orders, stay in place through the end of April 2020. But then after that, you know, unless they're going to work something out with these people, you know, the notice of default will begin to circulate and the uh, foreclosures can commence. And uh, if any of you uh, have SBA loans or know people that have SBA loans for uh, 7A loans and Section 504 loans, the SBA just sent out notices saying, you've got six months of uh, free payments. Not a deferral. They sent out a notice of forbearance. So for example, I, I have a, a building that I run my law practice out of that I, that I purchased. And without even asking for it, I just got a notice in the mail saying, you've got six months of free payments and not getting tacked onto the back end or anything else. So kind of a nice thing to know about the uh, certain SBA loans that are out there. So that is everything I wanted to talk about today. I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has any questions at this point, but it seems like we've covered them as we've gone. Um, and then if anybody wants to speak with me privately, I believe slide one likely has my contact information, at least on my version of it, it does. Uh, um, it has the name of your company, but what's your number, Rob? I can throw it in here real quick for them to, to get sure. it. Sure. My phone number is area code 714-456-9118. And my email is rob at voneshlaw.com. And it's R-O-B at V as in Victor, O-N-E-S-C-H. LAW.com. And if you guys want me to separately email you these materials, I'm happy to do it too. Just reach out to me. Okay. 
Okay, I did and, uh, John, question. I'm looking at the phone number. Uh, you, you put a zero where the nine should go. Oop. Thank you. There we go. That's it. Okay, yeah, I think we're good. I don't see any questions unless I'm on a delay from everyone.